So today I want to talk about low-cost connectivity testing for IVI or in-vehicle infotainment. I'm going to describe some challenges in that and how we can try and overcome them with our low-cost product. And then I'll describe um, how those challenges can apply to not just uh, connectivity testing but more generally with infotainment tests. And, and then I'll talk about maybe the future of IVI. And I'll give you two different uh, demonstrations of what the product can do using, uh, in this case, signaling for Bluetooth and for Wi-Fi. So to start with, what, what do we mean by an in-vehicle uh, system, an in-vehicle infotainment system, IVI? Well, basically, I see it as an interface. It becomes the center of the car. It's the way in which information gets served to you. Um, so, for example, you're very used to seeing a, a, a GPS inside your car providing navigation, so that information is served to you in a variety of different ways. Of course, you've got uh, the communication inside the car, which is quite common now. You know, cars are connected, right? So it could be uh, cellular information, and it could be also entertainment, right? So you just want to switch on your DAB radio or something of that nature. And naturally, of course, that information that gets served to you, you have to respond to it. Um, and this is an interesting area in, in, in IVI at the moment, is how you respond, how you interact with the car, actually. At the moment, that's mainly through touch. It could be a touch screen. It could be through actual physical control controls. But there's a lot of innovation in this area, which we'll come on to talk about. So that's what I kind of mean by an IVI system. So what's driving that market? Well, the first thing we often forget is the Internet of Things. So basically the concept of connecting people, uh, processes, and data is something that the automotive industry is clearly not immune to. And I back it up with a statistic that says by um, 2020, one in five cars are going to be connected to the, to the Internet. So you can see that this idea of um, mobility and communication is, is really important and will clearly influence the IVI system. The second thing is autonomous driving. Um, I mean, clearly, it, it, there's a lot of innovation in this area, backed up by the statistic there and the number of patents that you're starting to see. Clearly, if you, if, if you have an autonomous vehicle, how you interact with that IVI system will change dramatically. In fact, you could argue, do you have to interact at all, right? And then just to back that up further, we've got this idea of shared mobility or ride sharing or car as a service. So clearly that, that's going to change how you interact with the car and hence what you really want to do with the car actually when you're inside it. In fact, you will be a passenger really, potentially. Um, you'll be one of a number of passengers. So that changes the nature of what that IVI system does. And of course, the topic mainly about we want to talk about today is connectivity. And un connectivity underpins a lot of those, those, those drivers, clearly it's important. And some OEMs have realized that importance, this idea of mobility and communication, and already committed to having all, the, all their vehicles with fully connected IVI systems. So that's really no surprise. So let me give you some examples um, of what people are thinking about for the future. And the first would be something like uh, vehicle to infrastructure. So how does the vehicle um, respond to road signs? How does it tell you how to park? Those are kind of things that allow the car to engage with things outside, but clearly that has to be served to you as a, as a driver through the IVI system. Second example would be vehicle to home. So you sometimes now have applications on your phone, you switch on your car before you, before you go and get in it and things of that nature. And you can start to see that you're engaging with things in your home. It could be how you charge your car, if you like your vehicle. Um, what you're going to do with that, how you set it up, how you open doors, how you open your garage perhaps as you drive in your driveway, things like that. Then you've got vehicle to person. And again, clearly for things outside the vehicle, you're going to have some degree of wireless technology playing within that. If a pedestrian's walking across the road, you're starting to look at how the likes of ADAS play into how the IVI then responds back to you as a driver. And it could also be things such as even if you're fit to be a driver. So the IVI system, is actually checking, for example, your eye movement, or are you still alive? I mean, are you capable of driving? Are you drunk? Um, and then we've got vehicle to grid, and that, that's mainly about, for example, understanding where you can find a charging point, um, how you set the system up, etc. And finally, vehicle to retail, one that maybe doesn't get talked about very much, but another wireless technology playing within that. So if you know your location, what about um, having someone deliver the shopping to you? So you're going, you're going somewhere else, you come back and you've got a delivery in the boot of your car. You have something for, uh, delivered uh, from, from a shop. All these things require connectivity. So those examples of market drivers, what about market trends? I think it's no surprise that you understand that the IVI system is kind of the command center of the car. And what will become interesting over the next while is how you then interact with that. We're seeing more and more voice 
within the car, and it's a pretty natural thing to, to do, right? Is just to simply talk to your car. And the third thing is software architecture. So typically OEMs would talk about horsepower. They talk about the size of the engine. Actually, consumers are starting to think about, hmm, what kind of wireless technologies do you have in the car? What does the IVI system do? And to kind of cater for that and to also provide those services, be it from third parties or from OEM themselves, you're starting to see a lot of development from big players like Google and Apple in terms of software architecture. And the reason I mention that, of course, is software plays a big part in regression tests. Regression tests is very important for IVI systems, particularly as they start to interact with more and more systems. And my summary really is what I'm saying is that ultimately IVI systems are not immune to the current pace of transformation within the automotive sector. And I think we can demonstrate that. I've kind of alluded to the test challenges. So the first is increasing complexity. So that IVI system that maybe used to be just doing some basic navigation, it is now serving you information about whether a pedestrian may be in front of you. That's because, for example, you're getting consolidation between what is a cluster. So by cluster I mean how fast you're going um, and how much fuel you have. So that's typically what you see in front of you versus what you have on your left hand side typically is your infotainment system. That consolidation means that actually that IVI system is now serving you safety critical information. What does that mean for you as a test engineer? That means you need to test it. Now there's certain legal cases you need to test in any case for an IVI system. I'll give you some examples. So um, there's some Japanese ones where you need to check how the camera interacts with the display that you see, checking the tire treads, checking how you park. Those are legal obligations. And so you can see that whilst it's becoming more and more the heart of the car, it's engaging with many, many complex systems. So it's going to be pretty hard to test. And to that end, let's think about software regression tests. I mean, a typical project might have, say, 80 to 100 engineers checking in code, maybe on an early basis, so you're regression testing overnight. How are you going to do that when, you're in, when you've got more and more complexity within your code? And time to market, clearly, it's always a demand and reducing costs of test. Another thing to bear in mind is an OEM, you've got multiple vendors, you have multiple displays, you have multiple ECUs, and when we talk about connectivity, of course you may have multiple silicon vendor um, of modules and technologies inside those ECUs, inside those systems. And you as a test engineer, depending on what part of the life cycle you're at, you may not know what's inside that. So I'm asking you how, you, how do you address that challenge? And finally, maintenance. What happens when things go wrong? Um, are you doing over-the-air um, updates to the car? How do you know that works? How have you tested that? So these kind of technologies are ones that are existing dashboard solutions, things like radio, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, GPS, keyless entry and tire pressure monitoring perhaps. This is a very traditional dashboard solution, but really what we're seeing is that the new generation of IVI systems is effectively bridging the gap between these existing dashboard solutions and non-IVI technologies. Things such as radar, LiDAR, LTV, DSRC, based on, for example, 802.11p, and eCall technologies. These are all wireless technologies that in some way, whether you know it or not, may be serving information within the system to you as, as a driver or indeed as a passenger. So let's have a look at some of the NI-based IVI test solutions. And the first one, of course, you maybe will know is the vector signal transceiver. So this is a uh, a PXI based module offering frequency coverage from 65 megahertz up to 6 gigahertz. And if we take that and compare it with the Conrad communications test or RFC T2400, it's pretty similar in terms of frequency coverage. Um, clearly the VST at the cost price of around $60,000 is a much more highly calibrated and accurate piece of equipment. Uh, it has a wider bandwidth of course as well. Comparing that with something from us which is lower accuracy, um, with a narrower bandwidth, but a big cost differential. One of them is non-signaling, the VST is non-signaling based only. The 2400, and this is what's unique about it, is it also combines signaling, so it's non-signaling and signaling within the same test platform. We also, with the signaling means that we can do network performance tests, and I'll come on to demonstrate that, which can be very useful for certain use cases. And then things like the FPJ and a variety of different MIMO configs, that's, that's the domain of a VST. So these are very different products and they serve different purposes. So I want to be clear, 
that what I'm going to talk about is a low-cost solution, which has certain use cases that you may find uh, good for your test needs. So let's look at the test life cycle. So I've said that one of the key differentiators and things that you might find useful is signaling test. Why is that relevant? <coughs> Generally, as you move through your life cycle, you start with signaling tests because you, you clearly want to check the protocol as part of your test, testing requirements. And as you move to the right-hand side here and move towards manufacturing, you're going to be driven by cost and, and also speed of test. So just an example, protocol stack's great. It makes your life pretty simple sometimes from a test mode perspective because you're using the device in a normal mode of operation. <coughs> However, with the protocol stack comes expense in terms of the test equipment, typically. And secondly, it can slow you down. Comparing that with non-signaling, where if you have a device test mode, so test mode, I mean an engineering proprietary mode, could be within the silicon, that allows you to test it easier, usually faster, and designed for the purposes of doing test. And for the most part, <coughs> that means that you have a lower cost of test and measurement. But this is a generalization. This is based on the past 10 years. One thing that has changed, and has come from NI, is the concept of a software-defined radio. And with a software-defined radio, if you can calibrate it and make it accurate enough, you can probably buck this trend. And that's what I'm trying to allude to with our product. It's a kind of a disruptive product, given that it can have the two use cases at $12,000. And it actually includes uh, a software-defined radio from NI, from his research. And we've taken that, we've calibrated it, and, and that's how we've come up with this product. So in summary, whilst this is generally true, I think by combining the signal and non-signaling from the 2400, we've got something that's quite unique and a little bit different. So what do we mean by signaling? Let me give an example. So here we have uh, support for 802.11ac Wi-Fi, and what you might wish to do is do some over-there tests, for example. So you might pull back a uh, power sweep, you pull back the RSSI, for example, and maybe do some throughput testing, which I'm going to show you. What about Bluetooth LE? In that case, you can read services from the device, a bit like what you see on your phone, what, what it's capable of, read that back. And then you can uh, also write to that device and, and read information back. What's shown here in the diagram as well, in addition, is you can see there's a UART HCI interface. So if you had, um, if you did, for example, want to do non-signaling tests, you can also use the instrument to connect using the HCI, using the D10 mode of Bluetooth LE, the device test mode operations. That's also something you can avail of. But what about non-signaling? Well, for automotive test, we have a modulation test toolkit. And this covers modulations such as ASK and, and uh, FSK and, and, and the like. And these tend to be sort of slightly customized proprietary standards often. Um, for likes of tire pressure monitoring and for uh, keyless entry. And we've got some good, good examples of deployments there. Not forgetting, of course, we've mentioned a few times about GPS, GNSS, and that could be in the form of uh, uh, Gal Gal Galileo or, or GLONASS, for example. Um, and that's what, it, what you see on the right-hand side here as well. So we would use the non-signaling part of the box to, to do that. Bluetooth support for non-signaling. Um, I've mentioned all the standards there. <coughs> If, for example, you were to use one of the NI libraries, the Bluetooth toolkit, you would be able to reveal of standards up to Bluetooth 5, actually, at this point as well. But that's using the non-signaling part. And then for Wi-Fi, again, you can get one of the, the toolkits, the wireless and test toolkits from, from NI. A few different choices, but you'll get all the support for 802.11a, b, g, n, a, c, and actually now a, x as well. And of course, what's, what's good about having a general purpose software-defined radio that's been calibrated is if you do have an emerging standard, let's not forget, you can pull back power, you can pull back spectrum. And that's often very useful from a functional test perspective where you, you don't necessarily need to dive into all the different um, detailed test requirements if you're looking at just simple functional test. So what about non-signaling? Is there some potential problems? So we've seen this trend over the past 10 years of moving towards non-signaling based equipment such as the VST and, and, and competitors of that. And that's how you reduce cost in, in production tests. However, it's not as necessarily as simple as that. Sometimes you don't have a dot test. Sometimes you, you don't even have that facility, right? So what do you do? <coughs> we 
Well, this is where signaling comes in. You may also know that the device doesn't have the <coughs> excuse me. Sometimes you know that the device doesn't have the test mode because it's not intended to. Because the device itself is flashed with the, the customer firmware. And therefore, you can't use non-signaling test techniques. Excuse me a second. So this is where we start to talk about the likes of end-of-line testing, where, for example, you have customer firmware and customer software, <coughs> and you want to test it. Or, of course, you may just want to use signaling to emulate the real world, in which case, that's exactly what you want to do. You want to use the signaling sub subsystem within the instrument. You may also want to do some throughput tests, and you can't do that with non-signaling uh, test equipment. And sometimes you only want to do a functional test. And I think this is what I want to highlight is, if you only want to functionally test a device, do you need to invest in protocol test equipment? Do you need to invest $60,000 in a vector signal transceiver? You've got to ask that question. Now, in automotive, I don't want to suggest at any point that, that quality is not important. Of course it is. But if you were to take the extreme of an IoT device, it could be a wearable IoT device, it could be worth $1. It's going to be a throwaway device. So you have to think about what equipment you're going to buy. In. And a low-cost signaling test solution may be one way to solve that problem. So here I want to start to focus on some signaling use cases. <coughs> and I think what you can see here is I'm focused very much on design verification production and maintenance. These are the three use cases that you can apply generally across IoT and automotive, and certainly for infotainment systems. So let's take the example of product life cycle regression test. I said one of the complex challenges was the amount of check-ins you're going to get and the complexity of the systems. So how are you going to check all that wireless connectivity? Well, one way to do that is to regression test using the signaling. Let me give an example. So you put something in a chamber, you could, might put an ECU in a chamber, it might be, um, you might want to heat it up, you might want to do environmentals, and you're able to use this instrument to do over the air tests, reading and writing registers, and uh, breaking and setting up connections constantly. And what that does is it stress tests the product continually over its time, and that's really excellent for automotive customers because sometimes you have to supply a warranty. It could be 15 years. How are you going to, to test that? How are you going to stress test your components? And that's one way of doing it. In manufacturing, I think this is probably the sweet spot of, of this instrument where you can do end of line testing. So it's a mix of RF power metrics, over the air test, and throughput testing. And it can do all of this. And finally, what about aftermarket? I mentioned the complexity of maintenance. Um, there's some really interesting challenges in the automotive supply chain of these complex systems going into, in, into a car garage. How do you test them? It's a very good question. So why don't I hone in in one of these examples a bit more in a bit more detail? I'm going to start with the product lifecycle regression test. So here I want to tell you what the goal is, and then show how we address some of those IVI challenges I alluded to at the start. So the first is you need to stress test an ECU, and that ECU has some Wi-Fi and it has some Bluetooth. And you might also, as I mentioned, want to do some thermal heating, and you want to continually stress test it. You might want to set up a connection and break it down continually. You want to do over there test. Sometimes that's the only option you have. You've got a software regression test it. You don't have a non-signaling test mode. And actually, what's great about this is you can test multiple ECUs as well. So this example shows that we can reduce the complexity of the setup because we've got over there test. We're not using a test mode. We're doing it over the air, based on protocol. It doesn't matter if it's from Continental. It doesn't matter if it's from Vallejo. It doesn't matter who it's from. Whatever component you're testing, if you're doing over the air tests in a normal mode of operation, it doesn't matter. And that's also very important. And ultimately, what we're saying is we can reduce cost and time to market with a platform of this price point. Let's then look at the end of line example. It's pretty similar. In this case, for example, we'll say again it's an ECU, it's got Bluetooth, it's got Wi Fi, but you may wish to be using the Bluetooth side of things to read and write registers. So that might actually be causing an onward function to be tested. 
So for example, in the demo I'm going to show you, I switch on some LEDs. Now, that's pretty trivial, right? But let's think of that in a car context. Maybe your read and write and register cause uh, something to move along CAN that tests something else, switches something else on. So you can start to see how having the ability to use signaling and read and write registers can be pretty useful to you, depending on the particular device you have and what function you want to test. So again, it's over our setup. You have final customer shipping firmware. And here you're testing multiple uh, silicon from different vendors and the components themselves from different vendors. And you also want to run throughput testing at the end of line. Because typically, at the end of line, what you're going to do is you're going to check a manufacturing process. You're not necessarily there to check the ability of your module, check the ability of your silicon. And particularly with IoT, and, and automotive is not immune to this, there's more and more modules. So if you're integrating a module into your product, you've passed your SMT process, and you've attached some antennas, you want to check that it's alive. You just want to see if there's some power. You might want to do a simple RF parametric power measurement, maybe some spectrum, and then you're going to finish with some throughput test, because that starts to involve a few other components within the RF. And that in itself gives you the functionality you need to ascertain that you can ship that device. So how does that address the IOI test challenges I mentioned? Well, again, we talked about increasing complexity. This is a great way of addressing that. Software regression test is taken care of. Um, I, I should have mentioned as well, of course, we've got a number of different APIs. It could be LabVIEW, C, Python. This is all automated. Um, some people address this challenge in, in manufacturing, particularly in Asia, uh, for low-cost devices. They may use um, a golden radio. They may use a real network. Well, that's great. But what happens when your network goes down? What happens when, when, your, when your golden radio fails? What, are you going to stop your production line? So this is where this fits, because it's low-cost enough that you will replace those golden radios with something like this. And it gives you a lot more flexibility, and you put it inside an automated test system. So now I'm trying to give you some demos, and I'm, I'm going to concentrate on the unique aspects of the product. So the first is going to be Wi-Fi throughput testing. Not particularly exciting, but I'll, I'll uh, use um, some phone clients um, I've got here. And then I'm going to show you Bluetooth LE functional test. So let me just see if I can set this up. So I've got a webcam to try and show you what's actually happening here. Okay, so we have on the right hand side a little bit of lab view. And what we're going to do is we're going to set the RFCT up as a Wi Fi access point. You can be a client, you can be an access point. First things first, we're going to connect to the instrument. So we're using Ethernet. If I drag this over, you might just about see what what I have here if I move my water bottle. Um, so this is the instrument here, and you can see the antenna. So it's all over the air. My phone over the air. Although I've got it connected because I'm I want to show you the screen. That's how I'm serving that to the projector. So that that's what's going on. So you can see here the Wi-Fi access point has been enabled, and we're running what's called an iPerf server. Um, you, you probably have heard of this before. It's a, it's a good way of doing a throughput test. It's kind of a recognized way of doing it, whether it's over the air, whether it's across Ethernet, it doesn't matter. But typically what you have is an iPerf server on the instrument, and then we've got iPerf clients. So this is my this is my Apple iPhone here. And you can see if I go to Wi-Fi, that we should be able to find, if I put it a little bit closer, and make it easier, ah, it's find the 2400 iPerf server. So you can see on the right hand side we've now connected. That's a pretty good RSSI actually, so I've, I've put it, as you can probably tell on the webcam it's off the screen, but we're pretty close to the antenna, right? So we're starting to pull back the RSSI, we're pinging it, we've got the MAC address. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to run the, the iPerf client. I'm going to switch. So this is just um, this is just some client I got off um, Apple iStore just to serve the purpose. So I've set it up for certain certain ports, certain data, certain time. I'm going to launch it, and you should be able to see, I move it a little bit closer, because you do get a little bit of, um, there's a lot of Wi-Fi flying about, let's put it that way, but in theory you should have about 150 megabits per second. This is a, a single um, 
single MIMO setup, you're not going to get anything beyond that. So practically, you know, we're sitting around maybe 50, 60 megabits per second. That's not really a surprise. Um, whilst we're also pulled back in our society, if we pull it away from the antenna, you should see this drop quite significantly, if not, just not work. <laughs> and you can see the RSSI has gone down as far as minus, minus 82. So a very simple example, but what's important here is from an end-of-line perspective, this is a great way of doing some sanity checking on, on your device, particularly for an IVI system. The next thing I want to do is I want to move to our Bluetooth LE example. So let me bring this across here so you can see what, what's going on. And I'll bring up another piece of lab here. Okay. Disconnect this one. Disconnect. Okay, so here we're going to use Bluetooth LE, Bluetooth LE plugin. So I need to run this. Again, we're going to connect on the same IP address. You can see here we've enabled the Bluetooth. And what it's going to do is it's going to start to scan. Now it's actually trying to scan for a particular device, but it'll pull back a whole load of ones. It depends how many. Uh, Bluetooth LE devices we have here. So there's all sorts. What have we got here? We've got, uh, let's see. Well, it's not found the one we're looking for. If you can see this in the webcam, this is a little IoT device from Nordic Semi. It's just to serve a purpose for this demo. I think it's not working because it's gone to sleep. So if I shake it, it's got an accelerometer. It should hopefully wake up. And if it does, I, okay, so on the right hand side, you can now see it's found the the aptly named thingy. <laughs> so we find it um, in the list, that's it there. And we've read back some service. Now, you can see it's got an LED, it's got colors. It's also got uh, durometer, it's got humidity, it's got temperature, all these different things. So imagine this very simple development kit, but in the context of something that you want to test. It could be something industrial. It could be an IVI system, of course. It could be anything. And by reading and writing registers, in the case here we're reading the battery level, or indeed writing something to a register to change a colour, you can see that you're functionally testing something. And that, that's really the, the, the key of this demonstration, is that you're able to do this over the air using the, the 4.1 standard. Um, probably the most exciting thing of this demo is if I play a sound. Um, <laughs> Anyway, you, you get the picture, right? You can do anything with it, and uh, it depends on the device and features that it supports. So I'm going to go back to the presentation. Okay. This back. So in summary, um, what I've kind of introduced you today and what's also available on the trade floor, if you want to take a further look is a different kind of tester, it's low cost. It is certainly applied to automotive. We've used it for a number of different applications. It provides 70 megahertz up to six gigahertz test and signaling and non-signaling. So what about other IVI test needs? Well, we were very focused on connectivity, but there's other testing that you may need to think about if you're, te if you're developing a System. And this example we've shown here is a, is a concept that we've developed for testing infotainment panels. Now, certain elements of this will have Wi Fi. I could give you an example of um, what's going on here. So, we look to the right hand side, you can see a robot. So, that robot is imitating, if it, in effect, the driver. Why would you want to do that? Well, first of all, if you're testing panels or testing systems uh, with operators, be really challenging because, as I said, it's a complex system. I'll tell you first of all, there will be 42 different languages typically in an infotainment system. There is no operator who's going to be able to test that. So you will have to have a vision camera to actually interpret that information. You will then maybe use a robot to test the panel. And you may also have the sensors as well. Now the sensors, I mean by cameras, are sitting down below uh, the chamber below. And actually you may want to be serving information to those cameras you might be wanting to have a dynamic uh, scene. If you come to the booth, you'll see this, where we have a virtual drive test. We take the output of that virtual drive test and we inject it into the camera sensor. And what's great about that is typically in automotive, you have a lot of LCD screens. 
and you put the camera in front of it. There's a really poor way of doing it because you get light pollution, it's not a controlled environment. What we have here is something about the size of a laptop. And think of it as a high definition industrial display that's lying on the ground, flat. We have an optical chamber on top of it and the camera sits on top. So you can see that you're taking something that's normally very large and putting it on the bench, in this case inside a rack. And that is providing an input into the IVI system. So we're not just checking what's in the ECU, where it's Wi-Fi, whether it's Bluetooth. We're not just checking other elements of the sensor, such as tire pressure. We're starting to build up the ability to test the whole system. Components, system, and system of systems. This is the camera system I alluded to here. I actually should have shown you this in the first place. But if you look at the far right, I mentioned the tire tracks, I mentioned parking and things like that. It's really important to check. And there's like legal um, obligations around doing that. And finally, what about the future of in vehicle infotainment systems? Well, I think the first is that we're going to see a deeper integration of ADAS, Advanced Driving Assistance System. There's no doubt whether you are still a driver um, or indeed you're using a car as a service, that consolidation of what you see as from the cluster to the infotainment system is all becoming one. I'll give an example. Heads up displays now that sit on the dashboard will serve all that information. And if it does that, it has to be safety critically tested. It's also fair to say that the idea of providing a service is becoming uh, more important, whether it's from a fleet management perspective, whether you're an insurance company, whether you're an OEM trying to upsell you as a consumer, um, or indeed to, to specify what the, what, what the driver wants versus a passenger. For example, you're seeing a lot more complex systems where you've got a slave eye guy system. So maybe the kids are in the back wanting to watch some TV. Well, that just increases your test needs and becomes pretty difficult. No doubt they'll have their own connection, right? Their own connectivity connection to whatever that's going to need tested. And I've already mentioned heads up displays. We're starting to see demands for that. We're looking at helping some OEMs test that. Why is that difficult? Well, the actual heads up display that um, will admit the light could be really small. So if you're going to use a vision camera, how are you going to test something really small like that? Some interesting challenges, because ultimately it's going to project onto a surface. What about gesture input? So you know we mentioned using voice, and that's kind of new, but things are moving to gestures as well, right? How do you test gestures? I mean, I mentioned, for example, some work we've done in haptics. Um, not sure how that's going to work when there isn't actually anything there for you to let's say actuate in the air. <laughs> and finally, I think artificial intelligence is starting to really give a customization to the driver, the passenger, whether, whether it can first identify who you are. And let's face it, if you've got a very complex car and a complex system, and you've got all these different sensors serving information, you have to be very careful what you give to the driver, what's important to them. So there has to be some intelligence there to work out what to give them. And that's where you're starting to see AI give that mix of um, a customized experience um, and also really actuate human as well as automated actions, be it inside the car or outside the car.